This is the Hound Pits pub, closed for business. Half the district marked off is dead from the plague. We're right under the Lord Regent's nose, and he don't know a thing. Interesting. Of course, if anyone finds out what we're up to, the watch will break in with swords drawn. And now that you've escaped, the Lord Regent's going to be tearing the city apart. Take you up to meet Admiral Havelock and the rest of the loyalists. The Admiral's a man to be reckoned with. If anyone can help you find that missing girl, Lady Emily, and clear your name, he can. Expect they're hard at work in there. Best join them. They'll help you get whoever really killed the Empress. I'm sure the Admiral was anxious to meet you. It wasn't easy getting you here. So it's starting at last, Admiral. He found our man. Even after six months in Cold Ridge Prison, he slipped out like it was nothing. Yes. Not surprising. He was the personal... We can continue this later, Lord Pendleton. The man of the hour is here. Corvo, I'm Admiral Havelock. A true servant of the Empire, like you. Until the Lord Regent purged those of us who wouldn't recognize his claim on the throne. And I'm Lord Trevor Pendleton. I represent the nobility in our little group. But we all act as equals here at the Hound Pits pub. This is a momentous occasion, Corvo. I'm going to come out with it. We've been building a coalition of loyalists aimed at ending the Lord Regent's tyranny and restoring the throne. At risk of execution, we're committed to finding young Lady Emily and seeing her crowned as Empress. We've got big plans, but we can't do any of it without you. We need your skills, your ability in a fight, and in helping us, we're going to help you destroy the men who murdered the Empress. Sorry, you must be exhausted. We can discuss this further after you've recovered, but before you retire, you should introduce yourself to Piero. He's challenging at times, but his industrious mind buys him that right. Yes, Piero's as much an artist as a technician. He's going to be crafting the gear you'll need. Go talk to him and then get some sleep. We can talk more when you've rested. Good to have you with us, Corvo. Nothing against the others, but there's no substitute for a man who's done his service for the crown. Stay alert and stay loyal. Have you talked to Piero yet? He made the weapons we left for you on your way out of Coleridge Prison. Go see him when you can. What a desolate pub. We are the patrons. You don't know what it means to work with a man who stood at the Empress's right hand. We can't bring her back, but at least we have the man she trusted most. And maybe we can help you right some of the wrongs done to you. This bar is mine, but please, treat it as your home. Good. I will. Now to find my own drink. Piero still wants to work with you. He's, well, he's not a diplomat, but he's a brilliant man. Damn, the 
bottles are all empty. No drink in this pub. Are you beetle? I'll be crafting your weapons and gear. All custom work. For you, I will create the tools of a master assassin. No! This cannot happen now. The tank of whale oil is running. Will you get a new tank from upstairs, please, while I hold this in place? Be careful. Oil's unstable. When it explodes, there is a terrible mess. Perfect. Now plug it in. Just get it in. Perfect. Thank you, Cole. Here, see? The assassin's mask. You're a wanted man, so everyone in the city knows your face. But this mask will mean terror to them. If you just hold still, the fit must be precise. There. Can you see normally? Lens out of alignment. There. Better now? I could create more for you. Upgrades for your gear, weapons, munitions. But our situation here is desperate. Scavenge the city for valuables, and I will resell them on the black market. That should give us the money to craft the things you need. Tell me what I can make for you. Yes, let's have a look. Your life will get even more difficult soon. You should rest while you can. Very well. You know best. Let me know if you need anything more. Second solution. Excerpt from a series of newspaper articles from prominent natural philosophers by Piero Joplin. It is through no fault of my own that the average citizen has expressed a preference for Sokolov's elixir over in my own formula, sold as Piero's remedy, a name I did not choose if you must know the truth. The public has spoken its usual message of idiocy, spending their coin as a means of selecting Sokolov's formula over mine which I believe to be equal if not superior. Much has been made over the popularity of these concoctions as a means of resisting this remarkable new plague. I say remarkable because this strain works with an efficiency we have not seen in the history of the empire. This plague, now making its way through the city of Dunwall, is unrivaled in its effectiveness. I have studied it within the blood of those so afflicted and it is nearly perfect, elegant, in fact. And while it is true that Piro's remedy and Sokolov's elixir are known to protect the body against the plague equally, my own has properties, not fully understood, which relate to the mind itself, and the spirit. And it is in this way that my formula wins out. Here, is where one should pay attention to this contest. For you see, Sokolov's elixir, with its emphasis on the brute, animal body, is a crasco better suited for livestock. 
the subtle and secret variants in the key ingredients making up Piro's remedy ensure that it works on the higher functions that separate humankind from the mindless blue-jawed hagfish swimming in the Renhaven River. Piro. No. I will not sign off on these purchases. A bag of powdered crystal? Kyvian ore? What's wrong with the metals in Grishl? King Sparrow feathers? If you need feathers, sacrifice your own pillow. Maybe at the Academy everything you needed was paid for by tariff and handed out willy-nilly, but this is my bar, or what's left of it, and we're operating on a budget. We're running low on oil, food, elixir, building materials, and everything else, so you've got to slow down. While I'm footing the bill, I will not approve your purchases unless they're absolutely required. No more copper wire or special herbs. If you need these things, go out and scavenge them. Half the city is in ruins, so no one is going to miss any of the odd crap you seem to need. Admiral have luck. My break with the Academy was explosive, for lack of a better word. I had to rebuild from scratch, but so much the better. I was sick of using tools made by lesser men. Dead counter responsibilities. Excerpt from a manual on new city watch procedures. Commissioned by the Lord Regent in the face of the growing plague crisis, the dead counter is a position that will only be given to officers, usually of junior or middle grades. In most matters of edict or curfew enforcement, these officers will defer to the acting officer on duty. However, any dead counter will have command in situations related to the plague and the handling of the dead, including those with late-stage plague symptoms called weepers in common parlance. Starting in the month of rain, interested officers may apply for the test and, if accepted, for the two-week training tour. Pay will be administered in coin and rations of elixir, at one and one-half normal pay grade. Failed Experiments Excerpt from a series of lectures on natural philosophy, by Piero Joplin. Of course I have attempted to improve upon Sokolov's designs. Of course. And why not? After all, it is likely that his thinking was influenced in some small way by our time together at the Academy. We are all part of a community, striving to unknot the mysteries of the cosmos. Even those among us who possess the greatest minds are often led to a fruitful line of consideration by, how does one say it, our intellectual subordinates. Sokolov is no exception to this, despite the glamour of genius he has cast over the aristocracy. And further it is true that many of my experiments have failed. No need to gossip about it behind my back in your social clubs and in the very chambers of the academy itself. Great ambition requires risks. You may laugh now at my door to nowhere, but someday you will not. Your children will likely see it as commonly as you see the electric lamps lighting our streets at night. But a few short years ago, 
You would have laughed at Sokolov's arc pylon or wall of light. Your laughter, your condescending smiles, they are nothing but evidence of your own limited imagination. Whale vivisection. Excerpt from the notes of a natural philosopher aboard a whaling ship. Remarkably, each specimen I had the pleasure of studying during the voyage possessed some minor variants in physiology. On the second leg of the trip, east of Tivia, the crew hauled aboard a female, some 42 in length. I estimate she weighed 35 tons and the ship sat low, rocking side to side through the night with her thrashing. By candlelight, I took her apart sketching and taking notes. Against her bellowing, I cut into the mass of tentacles around her mouth. Within I found row upon row of teeth and a baleen running along the upper jaw. Through this broom-like structure, I assume she filtered food from the water that was too small to be chewed. Whale oil processing. Excerpt from the founder of the Greaves Whale House by Ebenezer Greaves. Altassi, they secure the beast with hooks, with lines cast from the main ship, and from several smaller boats. Buoys keep the whale from diving deep. Once it's caught, a larger hook is driven through the tail, which is used to hoist the creature up through the chute. They moan, and bellow for some time as the men get them onto the deck, then lift them into the scaffolding overhead. The ship adjusts its prow and returns to port in Dunwall, where the crew works on the great creature, slicing off the fattiest parts, while it still lives. Whale Oil Refilling Station Sokolov no longer has the upper hand with regard to supplies of whale oil. The good admiral has paid for the installation of my own system, which will enable me to work in this place. The oil tank dispenser, when activated, will produce an empty vessel for filling. When the empty tank is near the oil tank refills pump, the magnetic attractor should take the tank and lock it in the correct configuration. Using the lever will begin the refilling process. Once refilling is completed, the tank can be removed and placed in service. Extreme caution must be used in handling the full tanks. They are quite unstable. The system is sound and well engineered. It appears that the Greaves Oil Company has done something correctly, for one. The Academy teaches that absurd idea that the energy in whale oil arises from maintain life functions at extreme ocean depths. The pressure in the cold are too much to endure without it. I speculate that a human being might, by a process of adaptation, produce high energy humors in the body. I could build a tank that would slowly increase pressure on a subject over a long period of time and then observe them for years if need be to see if the formulation of energetic substances develop. Surely the Empress would be able to furnish me with facilities subject in the necessary legal amnesty. You must have known Sokolov at court. Clever, yes, but fundamentally a second-rate mind. Tell me what I can make for you. Not now, Beetle. This pub does not serve these anymore. Do not attempt to 
house or care for a friend or family member who shows signs of blood on their face and chest area. The only way to help them is to bring them to the city watch. They will be taken to the flooded district for treatment. Of course, the plague, the pub is closed. That's why there are no patrons. Thankfully, I am not employed for my intelligence. Much so, but no need to fear. He is here to work with our masters. People say he killed the Empress. Of course he didn't. People are foolish and believe whatever they're told. Okay. If the Admiral trusts him, then so will I. The Admiral served in the Navy under the Empress. But something happened with the Lord Regent that drove the Admiral out. If I understand it right. I don't trust her. Lord Pendleton, have we met? Pleased to meet you, Master Corvo. I saw you at court in happier days, but you might not remember. I was once a close ally to the Lord Regent, Hiram Burroughs, Back when he was just the spy master. He's one manipulative bastard, I can tell you that. If I am going to rescue Emily, I need to help myself with stuff. Stealing. I'm acquiring. My furnishings have been installed at last with no small amount of complaining by that antiquated boatman. The others have no idea what it's like to suffer as I have. Speaking of which... Wallace! Please breathe two bottles of Dunwall Red, never mind which, and fetch a clean glass. <sighs> well... I'll begin again tomorrow. Gaffer's Tale, Volume 1. Excerpt from the Travel Journal of a Young Whaler. A Gaffer's Tale, Volume 1, or A Gaffer's Early Adventures. My sister Nina and I left Tyvia together, saying goodbye to our aunt, the woman who had raised us since childhood, leaving behind our home city of Euro and the cold, but beautiful white landscapes we had always known. We boarded a ship for Dunwall. Our parents had left us with a sizable inheritance. 
and we spent half of this getting to the capital city and establishing a small import shop dedicated to Tyvian furs. Once I'd helped Nina establish the business, I was free to pursue my dream. Signing on with a whaling ship was the most exciting thing I'd ever done, and I saw it as a means to an end. Someday I would captain my own crew, and eventually own a fleet of similar vessels. With tears in her eyes, Nina kissed me farewell and I did not see her again for many months. As an apprentice to the Duffer, I got to see the tracking and killing of the great beasts up close. Nothing had ever fired my spirit so, as the wind and pounding waves, racing after a wounded whale, being pulled by a skein of cables embedded in its thick flesh. I changed more in those first seven months that I had in the previous seven years. Whaling was beginning to put its mark on me so that Nina barely recognized me when I returned, tanned and sinewy with muscle, where the creases already wrinkling the corners of my eyes. But she could see that I was filled with joy, having found my purpose. Admiralty and the Fleet Excerpt from a book on naval history. While each of the Isles has some form of naval fleet, none is more envied than that of Grisla, with its long, proud history of great ships and the admirals who command them. Boys come of age in the cities of Grisla hoping to someday captain such a ship, and family dynasties are made by those captains who track down infamous pirates or crash seditious uprisings, as during the Morley insurrection. In times of war and peace, Gristle continues to innovate at sea. The ship designs of Anton Sokolov himself now represent the highest standard in the whaling trade, allowing crews to haul their kill up over the deck and begin their butchery and processing, even as the ship returns to Dunwall. The crews can be seen working on their latest whale as the ship moves slowly up the Renhaven River, coming to dock with one of the powerful warehouse companies such as the Greaves Whaling House. Suspended in the rigging overhead and backlit by the setting sun, the silhouette of one of these creatures makes a moving sight as it cruises to its final resting place in the industrial heart of the capital Sun crew. It has been days since our men were dispatched to stash weapons for Corvo in the old sewer. They have not returned so I can only hope that they succeeded in getting the packages delivered. Pira spent considerable time and resources making those things. If I could find a way to mass produce them, the Dunwall Navy would secure its place as the dominant force on the globe. But back to Corvo. Can he actually break out of Coldridge and if so, will he make his way here? I personally give him odds of 1 in 5. Seems we've moved to a new phase. Martin's improvisations have borne fruit. The former bodyguard has been freed and is en route to the staging location. The Pendleton's voting block and my military connections. All we've lacked is the ability to project lethal force in a controlled manner against a previously inaccessible... Ah, to the point, we need a man who can kill the bastards for us. Corvo is more than capable of that, I have no doubt. End law. This is awful. Switch. Switch, where the hell is it? A Gaffer's Tale, Volume 2. Excerpt from the travel journal of a whaler in his final years. A Gaffer's Tale, Volume 2 or, A Gaffer's Final Passage. After more than a quarter of a century, I am done with whaling, too broken to continue. I've seen all the corners of the Isles and made more coin than most men see in a lifetime. But it's all gone. I've lived through an emperor and watched his daughter take the throne, fair young empress she was, but slain so young. Everything beautiful comes to die. I've eaten in every port of the known world and sailed in the loneliest waters you could imagine. I've seen the cliffs around Pandesia. Even the best of it doesn't give me an ounce of joy. The years come back across my dreams as a line of butchered bodies, long, sleek and singing among the waves under the moonlight, only to be speared by ugly, 
where this card men who'd knife each other for a good pair of boots. Each year one had less time to come home. My tongue forgot the language of small chatter and those who lived in the cities thought me odd. My sister Nina hardly knew what to say to me during our visits. When she lost her business to the Lord Regent's crooked barrister I was a hundred miles east of Morley, gaff hand frozen from the sleet as we tracked the first bull whale we'd seen in months. I helped her as much as I could, but Nina died in the early days of the plague. None of it mattered. If I'm jaded and bitter, it's because this industry has taken away my dreams. The world has beaten me. Must be Corvo. I am Lydia, at your service. Your room is upstairs and ready. When they told me who it was, well, I thought you'd be older, like the Admiral. Attention, citizens of Dunwall. The Old Port District has been added to the evacuation list. The Weeper count for the month of seeds has increased. The Lord Regent has decreed that plague ordinances will... The Shadow on Vitalis. Excerpt from Along the Work of Fiction. Finding my way by the feeble light of the dying fire, I saw her working. A large needle moved in her hand, following precise, esoteric patterns. Knots and loops of seamstress craft from ancient days. Beneath her needle, his body clenched and shuddered, shaking the wooden table. A morbid fascination pushed me closer, until she turned her blank face toward me, resting the needle in his flesh. With a refined tone, she addressed me. So you are the lover, I presume. You to have been unfaithful, and it is now your turn to be mended. In effect through the, the young prince of Tyvia. Excerpt from a theatre play. Lord Nathan Bale, shaking with outrage. How dare you, sir, clothed so in my very home. I should hand you over to the watch, depraved Tyvian. Prince Kalizar, moving closer. That's a harsh welcome for royalty, lord. Your daughter treated me with much more hospitality. Alas, she has gone out for the evening, leaving me all alone. Lord Nathan Bale, stammering studying the younger man before him. What are you doing? Leave this house. Go back to your frozen wasteland, pale rascal. Prince Kalizar, smiling coyly, reaching out. No need for anger between us, Lord Bale. Is it so wrong for me to be here? As I've proven, I've developed an affinity for you and your family. Lord Nathan Bale, gasping. Oh, my. Kalizar, your skin is so warm. It burns. Rain. Stay alert and stay loyal.
the Fugue Feast. Excerpt from a book on the celebrations and holidays. At the end of every year, after the last day of the month of songs, we begin the Fugue Feast. The new year has not started and thus the time that follows is outside the calendar. A period of celebration and feasting begins during which the people abandon the very practices that keep them whole and healthy over the year. Many leave their homes, euphoric with spirits or potent herbs. Some paint their faces or wear masks to conceal themselves as they pursue their passions without reservation. When the right cosmological signs are observed and it is time for the calendar to begin anew, the sitting high overseer calls for the hymn of atonement and the fugue feast ends. Families return to their homes, wives to their husbands. Onomies put down their weapons and fires are extinguished. No complaint is given for those who have wronged others, deviated from ancient codes, or discarded oaths, for this time during the astrological alignment does not exist, and is not recorded. The following day starts the new year, marked on the first day of the month of Earth, as it has always been. Call to the Spheres, Volume 1. Excerpt from a work of fiction. Early chapters. My stomach twisted as the engines of the old vessel roared louder. It was the creation of Orchado, third prefect from the Academy of Natural Philosophy. He was exhilarated, savoring each of the small craft's undulations. Orchado pulled a lever and a great gout of smoke surrounded us. The smell of burning whale oil grew unbearable as the machine propelled itself upward. I was too afraid to look through the window, which suddenly didn't feel thick enough. As if knowing my thoughts, Overseer Brian looked at me and smiled. Recite some of the litany, my pupil. It will protect your heart from the turpitude of the void on our way to the outer spheres. This must be my room. I'll go to sleep now.